Hey, what's going on? BQ here. Welcome to episode number two of the relaunched B-Side podcast. Now, if you're somebody who prefers to consume your podcast in a streaming format, just look up the Impact Lounge. Wherever you stream your podcast, you'll be able to check out the B-Side and the Total Nonstop Impact podcast. So what I'm going to be talking about this week is the return of Ken Shamrock to Impact Wrestling. Is Impact Wrestling getting a second TV show? I've talked about that a little bit on YouTube already. I'm going to link that in the description and the comments of this video. And then the heel versus face dynamic with Impact. Now, for the most part, I'll say 90% of the time, the fans seem to cheer who they're supposed to cheer and boo who they're supposed to boo. Now, there's some larger companies that can't nail this concept, and Impact's doing a really good job of it. And then I'm going to be talking about Cali Combat, my thoughts on the show. In the first 24 hours of this upload here on YouTube, I will be re-engaging with your guys' comments, so let me know what you think. I mentioned last week that I was going to read the most insightful comment on the podcast, so I will be doing that on the show. Stay tuned. But I definitely want to engage with you guys. Can't wait to see what you have to say about Cali Combat. If you like the podcast, if you like the opinion, if you like what I have to say, please give this video a thumbs up. And if it's your first time here, please consider becoming a value subscriber. I would love to have you here at the Impact Lounge. All right, let's get into the podcast. Your boy BQ, welcome to episode number two of the relaunched B-Side podcast. I hope you enjoyed the show last week. The format is a little different where I'm trying to focus a little bit more on the happenings of what's going on in Impact and put a little more, little less focus, I mean, on the, uh, the show itself. So we'll be talking about Kelly Combat. Um, the show was okay wasn't as uh wasn't as good as I really hoped hoped for but we'll be talking about that but I've got a couple um newsworthy things I want to hit on first we're going to talk about Ken Shamrock impact possibly having a second show um something new that came up about uh the road expenses that they uh they deal with the dynamic of heels versus faces and impacts compared to some of these other companies and then uh going to talk about Cali Combat so before I get into Cali Combat I'm going to get into a comment of the week from YouTube last week. So in the first 24 hours of the podcast upload, if you leave something very insightful or if it's a question that I want to answer or a subject, you know, something along those lines, um, I may read it on the show. So uh, before I get into Cali Combat, I will let you know who the comment came from and speak on it. Speak on what they have to say. So first thing, Ken Shamrock, is he's making his return to impact wrestling now he's the first ever tna champion in the books uh, he was the nwa champion he was on the uh the flashback or whatever they call <laughs> i know that i i think i mess that up every single time i podcast uh because i care so little about the clip on on impact but whatever throwback match it was it was ken shamrock when he won the title and i'm not a huge fan of bringing back these old guys um it does nothing for me but Color me intrigued on Ken Shamrock because it's not, this isn't someone we see on TV on a regular basis. You know what I mean? So even though the return of Rhino and, and bringing RBD back, even though that neither of those signings did anything for me, I'm more intrigued with Ken Shamrock. But the thing with Ken Shamrock, it's not like he has this long history with the company. Yeah, he was the first champion, but he was gone later that year. And then I think he might have returned in 2004 briefly. And then uh, left again. So, you know, it's not like he has this this long history. And I'm cool with, I think it's always cool to bring back older names. But the, the problem is, it just seems like the company is bringing, by, bringing back guys they think we want back. Instead of who we would actually want back. So, you can go back into TNA's history and find guys who, you know, were more mid-carters. And they could, you know, you could do an open challenge with Moose. You know, and, and he can run through some older guys from TNA's past, you know. I had a very similar pitch for Tessa Blanchard when she joined the company where she was really hot as a heel. And I thought it would be cool if she did open challenges and face knockouts of the past for, you know, a month or so. And I think that would have been cool. It would have kept her out of the title picture for a little bit, which is, you know, a good thing. Like, you, you don't want to just rush people into the title picture. Speaking of that... I have an upload coming on YouTube soon, uh, my way too early Bound for Glory predictions. So I'm going to predict the Bound for Glory card, even though the the set of tapings that's uh, leading up to the Bound for Glory hasn't even aired. 
So it's just something I enjoy doing. I only got one match right last year, and it was uh, I predicted a babyface Taya returning to challenge Tessa Blanchard. So definitely subscribe to the Impact Lounge on YouTube for that. But I pitched something very similar for Tessa Blanchard, run through a bunch of knockouts, and then ultimately lead up to Gail Kim returning. And she did get that match with Gail Kim, which is cool. Wasn't quite how I drew it up, but who am I, right? So it seems like they're kind of doing something similar with Moose. I hope this does get him to uh, the title picture, however. So Ken Shamrock, um, who knows what all he's going to do. If he's just going to have a match with Moose, there's kind of a rumor about him maybe having a match with Brian Cage. I think as cool as it would be if Brian Cage was the champion, it would just be a really like TNA thing to do to have him show up and get a title shot. So, you know, maybe if it was non-title or something like that, but we'll see what Ken Shamrock does as again, I'm, as I said, I'm a little more intrigued than, you know, RVD and everything. So we'll see what uh, Ken Shamrock does. And I haven't seen him compete in quite some time, but from what I understand, he still bumps very, very well. You know, they say he bumps like someone in his 20s. I I don't know how accurate that is, but the dude's 55. But from what I understand, can actually work pretty decently. Did a upload on YouTube about Impact possibly getting a second show and Cali Combat was supposed to serve as a trailer. Now it kind of seems like, I mean, and and the feeling of Cali Combat was no different than Impact. So I had said, you know, let's keep an eye on Cali Combat, the delivery, the presentation. Is it going to be any different? No, it was the exact same. So I don't really know. If there's much truth to that side of things where Kelly combat was a trailer, but it seems like there is some kind of truth to them getting a second show. But I think what I I was reading from a few people was that it's probably going to be a little closer to like explosion more than anything, more than it is going to be impact. So I think it's going to be more important than explosion, but not, not quite impact going to feature some guys that don't get as much time. I think they are going to look at a new announced team for it. And it's supposed to be like a studio setting. So what that means exactly, I don't exactly know. But I think we've been wanting a second Impact show for a long time. But I think there's less demand for it now because they are doing the monthly Twitch, the monthly Impact Plus. So with those, I'm not really sitting there like, oh, you know, I really want to get another Impact Plus show. I mean, an Impact show. And, you know, one of the many reasons I had gotten away from WWE was, was the oversaturation of content. And I don't really don't want impact to go that direction. Um, I don't think it's going to be to the point of WWE by any stretch, but I don't want them to oversaturate. So if you're going to do another show, you know, I don't know about the live impact plus and live Twitch show every month. You know, I don't know. It's it's basically like saying that's there's two pay-per-views and then, um, even when they do have the pay-per-views, they still put out those shows. So let's just stay tuned to that. Um, so let's just stay tuned and see if there's any real truth of this. Right now, the focus is getting on a freaking better network. Uh, Pursuit is not a good home for the company. And I thought it was embarrassing that at the beginning, they tried to paint it as a good home. It's kind of like when they moved to Destination America and Dixie Carter tried to say, they were taking a step backward in order to take a step forward. Like it it was so so ridiculous. And, you know, they did try to paint pursuit as a, as a real positive thing. The only positive thing is they were able to stay on TV. But as I said, last, last podcast, there's never been less eyes on the product than right now. So this needs to happen sooner than later. And hopefully around bound for, excuse me, around bound for glory, we get an, an answer on that. So something else that came up, um, the road expenses. So, so basically since Anthem took over, they, uh, the workers were paying for their own expenses. Um, I, well, not, not so much travel, like for flights, but hotel expenses, things like that, things of that nature. And to my knowledge, when Dixie Carter was around, now granted the company was, you know, struggling financially but from my what i understand dixie used to cover those things so anthem is obviously in a much better place than dixie carter so it, i guess over since Ra- anthem took over there was this was something they had communicated to the talent that hey we're, we are going to work towards how we can you know take care of those costs for you so it's a really positive thing because you know for these guys who 
or on the salary deals and everything, that's probably not as big of a deal. But the ones who are on paper appearances, you know, from the paper paper appearances rumored to range from two fifty to four fifty, which I actually think should be a little bit more because this is a bigger company and and you know that's kind of what you get on the indies. And in some cases, indies cover a lot of your expenses. For a lot of the the mid to lower card talent, you know, when you're getting paid a couple hundred per appearance and you're in charge of your your um your hotel and everything, well, you're not making a whole lot. You're you're gaining through exposure, and that's what you're what you're banking on, obviously. But this is a really positive thing if that's what they're doing going forward. It's a real positive thing, and it should make it easier to sign talent going forward because it's another perk to, you know, being involved with the company. Hey, is this what we're going to pay you? And we're going to cover this for you. So it's an obvious perk. Heels and faces. I want to talk about the heel and face dynamic. This is something impacts nailing right now. I would say 90% of the time the crowd boos for the right person and they cheer for the right person. And, um, I would say they're the only company really nailing that right now. And again, I've said a hundred times, hundreds of times, I don't really watch the other companies a whole lot. I do watch a little ring of honor here and there. I do watch AEW, you know, what they have put out. And then I haven't watched uh, WWE in a while, but you know, starting with ring of honor, they, and they're real similar to AEW actually was, was just like the lack of clear cut heel and face. Now, AEW has this thing going where with the exception of, I mean, a couple people, everyone is right on that that line like you can't even tell who the he or face is supposed to be in that company maybe that's something they're doing purposely to where they're trying to you know i think they want to make it more more sports and entertainment so i think they want the the crowd to just cheer for whoever they want to but i always feel like you got to have the yin, yin and yang so it's it's hard to differentiate the heel face dynamic in AEW. I always feel like with Ring of Honor, it's, it's a little difficult as well, because um, wasn't wasn't the Bullet Club a heel faction, you know? And I, I could be wrong on that one, but I, I understood that they were. But the crowd was always more for them than you know the guys who were wrestling, the, the the baby faces and everything. So that's a dynamic they they failed to nail because the they go for that indie feel and don't put as much you know emphasis on that. And then WWE. What really kills them, and I know they still do this to this day, so that's why I'm confident I'm talking about this, is the long fucking promos. And it's one thing to have a ring in ring promo by yourself. But nine times out of nine, you know, someone cuts out, cuts a promo, and then a few minutes through it, the other person's music plays and they come out and they go they do this back and forth thing, right? But the problem is they're so PG that the baby face always comes out on the bottom. You know, because as as a heel, you can be a little more snarky, and and you you really expose the baby face. You know, because they're not going to have that same those same level of insults. So, in that case, they have a big problem. Where I remember they had this problem with Kevin Owens real bad. Like he was dominating people on the mic, and then people were cheering for him and booing the baby face. You know, and it, it happens with a lot of their talent. People cheer and boo the wrong person. And I think they had that problem with Becky Lynch too. Um, some of you guys know better than me, but I read a lot of articles online, especially with uh, the gorilla position. Shout out to Ryan Bowman. And I know that when she was a heel, like she was getting over really well. And then it was kind of like, okay, well now we got to make her a baby face. And then all of a sudden she got super watered down. You know what I mean? Um, I watched a few of her promos online on YouTube and really felt that she was saying the same thing all the time. You know, from what I saw. So with Impact, you look at a guy like Sammy Callahan, who in another company, you could see the crowd getting behind him and OVE, but the crowd is not cheering for OVE. You know, they, they're they booing. I, I would say the only one that I can think of right now is like Jessica Havoc, where she's getting a lot of cheers. But I don't really know if she's the healer face or what they're trying to do with her exactly because Sue Young... <laughs> and her are feuding and I can't tell who's supposed to be the good guy who's supposed to be the bad guy but the crowd really pops for Jessica Havoc 
and they were more in the Cali combat show, they were more behind havoc than they were Alicia Edwards, but also the company has done a poor job of giving the, the crowd a reason to care for Alicia for the most part with everybody. They, they give them a good in ring program to do. And she just always is Eddie's wife. You know, and they have to give people a reason to care for her in the ring. And she has to rack up some wins here or there, you know. But I, I would say Havoc is one of the, you know, one of the ones where it, it, you never know what, what it's going to be. Even when Reno Scum came out and Jesus, Reno Scum, as much as I love him, you know, Impact painted him as a heel at heels when they came out to face Falabon KM. I think there were heels on Unbreakable, and then they came out basically as baby faces for Cali Combat. But the crowd was definitely behind them. They were definitely behind them. They uh, they were familiar with the scum, so that was cool. But I really thought the Cali Combat crowd was really engaged. Uh, I saw a couple comments online that you know they were dead or whatever, and I'm thinking this is actually the, one of the best crowds I've seen or heard with Impact in quite some time. And I was worried because you know California is home for me. I've never known it to be a strong wrestling community. So when they said impact was going to Southern California, I was like, Whoa, uh, I was sure that's a good idea, but the crowd did a really, really good job. So you know, it been both unbreakable and with Cali combat. And I didn't see the other show. I still got to see, uh, the, the one with the Hollywood championship wrestling starstruck. I still got to watch that one, but I would imagine that Don Callis and Scott Demore and these guys that this was one of their focuses was, was the getting that clear cut heel and baby face back, but someone can't be an over baby face. If the heel is not a heel, you know what I mean? And you can't hate the heel if you don't love the baby face. So that's an area where WWE has struggled for a super long time. You see it with, with Roman Reigns, obviously. Uh, and then you got ring of honor and AEW who just walked that, that, that fine line and don't really care. And if you've been hearing me podcast for a while, you've heard me use this example several times. But it was I was watching a Ring of Honor pay per view, and Donovan Dijak, who was the heel in the match, um, did some kind of flippy move, and then he stands on the barricades and starts, you know, pumping himself up, getting the crowd riled up, and I was so confused. I was like, if he's the bad guy in this match, why is he playing to the crowd and trying to get him behind him? You know, it's, it's weird. It's, it's, it's weird to see that. So I really, I'm really happy with what impacts doing with that. I really truly am, but let's get into the comment of the week from last week. And this is kind of comment slash question, but this one comes from dregs and I'm going to paraphrase a little bit. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But I'm going to paraphrase and talk about, you know, what I wanted to talk about with it. So it says, seeing how Impact is gradually signing newer talent, what steps could Impact take to have better usage of their partnerships to give their fans and their partners fresh faces to the titles or have a few others on tour taping with Impact until that limited deal is up. I do feel Nevea Christ would be the tamer of Havoc and giving Impact a possible knockouts tag team division or better yet, bring in the Twisted Sisters, Holly Dead, and Thunder Rosa. And he also mentioned bringing in Solo, Solo Darling, which to me, Solo Darling is so perfect for Impact TV. I think she would have been even more perfect with the you know the waning days of TNA with Corgan and all them. I think she would have fit in like really, really well there. But I think she would be an excellent addition to the division. Uh, Thunder Rosa and Holly Dead. Thunder Rosa has mentioned in the past that she had interest in working for Impact. So anytime someone has interest and they have a little bit of a name name value to them, like you definitely want to look into that. But the problem is that how close are Holly Dead and Thunder Rosa to Rosemary and Sue Young? You know, you can only have so much of that on the show. But I would have interest in in seeing them, you know, join the company later for sure. Nevea Christ, I've said this a lot of times. People say it on Twitter all the time. Like, how is she not part of Impact Wrestling? How is she not part of OBE? I would love to see her having be part of OBE. I think it's not going to be Havoc because they already got a monster. And, you know, you already got four people in the group. So you can probably add one person, but they, it's got to be someone smaller. So Nevea Christ will be perfect. She'll be good for the knockouts division. So hopefully we see that in the future. 
And you guys know I've all talked about uh, that. I've talked about wanting to see a knockouts tag team division again. And this goes back to the first part of what he said about how to better utilize these partnerships. Like you can have a freaking knockouts tag division. And I really think you don't have to have that on impact. You know, they can have the show the titles on impact, but that would be a good way of promoting impact plus and Twitch. These, these live specials to say, Hey, these, these knockout tag team titles are going to be on the line. They're going to face local competitors. You know, why not? It doesn't have to be on a TV show. Like I said, you know, that way you're not, it's not oversaturation. But as he said about better utilize, better utilizing these partnerships, you could, you could like better expand the roster. I mean, throw Aiden Prince on the damn impact roster page. Even if he only competes when they're in Canada, throw Reno scum on there. Even if they only compete in California and Vegas, throw Nevaeh Chris on there, throw, ah, what the hell's her name? She's a BCW girl. She's with women are wrestling. Also, she's kind of tall. Almost looks like she's Asian. Oh my God. If you guys know who I'm talking about, uh, leave her name in the comments. I, I, Oh God, I will say it next week when I realize who it is, but she's super talented, you know, use these partnerships to expand the roster. And they're, if they're just on per, you know, pay per appearance, they're on paper appearance and they show up, you know, they only record television in four or five different places. So at least give us the, uh, perception that the roster is bigger than it is, especially with the knockouts. So we've had, um, and I'm, man, her name is slipping my mind too, but the, uh, the newer knockout that was wrestling as the new girl, you know, she's not on the website. She said I'm impacts new girl. Her Instagram says she's impacts new girl. They call her new girl. She's wrestled a couple matches, but she's on, if you go on the website, she's not on the roster. Why not? Why not add her? I mean, there's people on the roster who are on paper, you know, paper appearance deals. So I think they could better, better do that. We saw Aiden Prince get an X division title shot. So that shows that now, okay, now when sh someone shows up from these partnerships, they may get a, a real opportunity, you know? So that's cool. They're not just coming on to job because that's what they had them doing before, but it's cool to bring those guys, these guys on the impact television, but we have to have a reason to care too. They had that uh, guy in the six way scramble, I don't remember what his name was. Real tall, kind of goofy high flyer guy. He was pretty good. Sorry, I just don't have those notes in front of me. That's why I keep forgetting all these names. But, uh, you know, I was just like, who is that? I don't even know who it is. Give us a reason to care. So if we see some of these guys on a special and then we see them on impact, cool. Let us know. Hey, you can catch this person in this in this company, you know. When we partner with them in the future, you might you might see these guys. But I really would just like to see them take some of those main names, add them to the freaking Impact roster, give us at least a perception that the roster is bigger than what it is. And again, if you only use them when they come to town, cool. But it seems like they're afraid to add people who can't travel everywhere with them or that they choose not to bring everywhere with them. Let's talk Cali Combat here. This was a super average show in my opinion. It was a special and it was probably promoted better than they typically promote impact. The card was okay. You know, I think looking at it, it was an inter in entertaining card, you know, it wasn't necessarily full of a bunch of main eventers, but it was entertaining. Um, I wasn't sure what to expect of it, but after watching the show or just during watching, I just, I thought it was okay. Um, the matches all kind of had the same pace to them nothing really got into the to next gear you know i for me it just they all felt really really similar the opening match michael elgin and rhino i've enjoyed everything and i mean everything michael elgin's done his promos are perfect his matches have been great again as much as he's kill, killing it in there and impressing the crowd is booing him they are not cheering for big mike maybe a little bit here and there but he's doing a great job as a heel um, I think he's up there with really Sammy Callahan as a heel right now. He's he's doing such good work. So this match with Rhino was was kind of just a couple big bodies going at it. You know, I, I didn't really see anything special that I loved out of it. And then the match ended in the double count out, which 
you know, we rarely see that. So you can't necessarily say, oh, well, it's a cheap way to end the match. It's We don't really see that that much. I mean, I guess it's better than getting a rubber match. But it's leading to um, Mexico. Like Josh Matthews says, now it's, it went from front end, front end to front on Mexico. Uh, they're going to have a, I believe it's a no hold barred match. or No, no, it's a false count anywhere. I'm sorry. So that should be pretty good. I'm, I'm expecting it to be better than than this match that they had for me, this was kind of safe. And for all the, the hatred between the two, I thought it was safe. And I said this last week, have they, ex- have they explained why Rhino has an issue with Michael Elgin or did it just come out of the blue? The brawl backstage they did with him was, was, was cool too. The North versus Reno scum. This was a tag team championship match. It was kind of a open challenge. And, um, uh, I watched Impact the next day, and the YouTube was like, oh, they dominated Reno Scum. Like, this was a pretty even match, and I particularly enjoyed it quite a bit, and I just think it's time to bring Reno Scum back. I talked with uh, Adam Thornstow, pretty comfortable speaking with him, and he said that they will be in uh, Vegas for those tapings, so they're going to have Reno Scum there, and then from there, they will see. But the commentary kind of alluded to the fact, you know, that, hey, you know, they've got... This might be their last chance to impress Impact. So they almost talked about possibly bringing him on. And when you got Don Callis in the booth saying those things, you know, maybe there's a real conversation being had. But uh, expect to see them in Vegas. And hopefully we see them on Impact going forward. But I was really excited with for this match. I enjoyed this one the most because I'm a big Scum fan and I'm a big North fan. And I think they both have a really similar style of wrestling, of, of tag team moves. and And for me, it was a good match. Madison Reigns backstage thing with uh, Jordan Grace. I'm enjoying Madison as a heel. The the locker room leader thing is uh, pretty funny to me. Jessica Havoc had a match with Alicia Edwards. And I knew when they announced this that this was going to be more about storyline than the match itself. Because you're looking out on paper. You're like, okay, this is going to be a squash. And it was. But you knew that most likely it was going to have to do more with the storyline. And there was the the thing with uh, Ace Austin you know, faking the injury beforehand. He, dude, Ace Austin's work in this is so fucking good. He is being a really good heel. And the the program they're building towards with him and Eddie, I think is is the best creative that they're doing right now for a storyline angle. So I'm really into it. I really strongly, strongly believe that the after the match, uh, the 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 mat the angle they had after the match in the ring with Eddie trying to run and getting choke slammed by Havoc. I think that they are setting up another intergender match. So, you know, they're doing the whole thing with Tessa. I think they're going to flirt here with Eddie versus Jessica Havoc. So let's see what happens there. But I really think there was a lot of moving parts to this match of Havoc versus Alicia. It wasn't just about being a squash. I think there was, hey, let's see what we can do with Havoc and Eddie. Let's further this storyline with Eddie and Ace and Alicia. Let's get some sympathy for Alicia. And as I said earlier, the crowd doesn't have enough reason to care about Alicia. So while they used to get behind her quite a bit, it's almost like you just know she's going to lose when she goes out there. So it's a little difficult to care. And then you got Havoc, who the, who the crowd is like really for. But this stuff was interesting. We get the Sue Young stuff again and this is where Impact is doing a really good job with Sue Young because she talks very little. This is her first time talking, and it's like nonsense. It's some other weird language. The Sue Young character would go up in flames if she were to talk. If she were to just talk normal English, that character would be done. The backstage things that OVE is doing right now is so entertaining. I didn't used to care for what they were doing, but now they're incorporating some like really good humor in there, but it's not corny humor it's it's just enough to be funny but still stay on course for what they're trying to achieve it's a good way of just making their their packages more interesting because you know one thing that i did not enjoy was the lax clubhouse stuff i didn't i I didn't i didn't like the music i didn't like the i don't like anything about them i never did and it was always just the same. I guess the only time I did like him was when they were when King was in there. And you didn't know what was going on with King. Is he with him? Was he against him? Like that was stuff was entertaining, but the rest was just kind of corny to me. 
And the OVE stuff was, oh man, this is the same, same, you know, yelling at the screen, saying we're taking over everything, but none of us have titles, you know. So now we got a title featured in there. Sammy is number one contender. And now Sammy is actually focused on Brian Cage to where I thought that was just weird. It's like, dude, this guy's the number one contender. He still keeps talking about talking about Tessa Blanchard. But this is what worries me because I don't know if they're trying to build Moose to be, you know, the number one contender eventually. So I don't know if Bound for Glory is going to be taking on Moose or if he's going to be taking on um, Sammy Callahan. I'm starting to think Sammy Callahan's going to get his title shot like in Mexico or something like that. And then they're going to move on to Moose. So if that's the case, Sammy's not going to win the title. So I'm hoping Bound for Glory is Sammy and then Moose gets his, you know, his shot after that. But he's just now focusing on Brian Cage and that's what really worries me. And then of course Brian Cage isn't on TV. So right now we have almost no reason to care about the world title. And I used to think, hey, keep the world champion off TV like back in the days when Hulk Hogan was champion, but I kind of see with modern day wrestling now like they got to they got to be out there in some way shape or form, you know. So the Brian Cage title reign is just it's not his fault, but it's it's been a mess so far. And it's really hard to care about whoever he's facing, you know. Moose, I literally, I really liked what Moose was doing, walking with the ladies. Uh, I'm in, I'm impressed with everything he does. I enjoy everything Moose does right now. He even kissed one of the chicks, so that was super cool uh, because that's not really something they show a whole lot, you know, the PDA thing. So that was pretty cool. Um, the promo he was cutting towards Ken Shamrock was good. So as I said it earlier, color me intrigued to see what, what they're going to do. X Division champion Jay Chris against Rich Swan. I expected this to be a lot better than it was, but you know it, it was cool. You knew there was probably no chance Rich Swan was going to win. The at first I had said, you know, I, I should I don't know if I said it, but I had the the thought in my head. Okay, like how come all these weeks are passing and Rich Swan isn't getting his title match? You know, his rematch. Like, and I was kind of bothered by it, but then I said to myself. Wait, no, I'd rather wait for the rematch than get the rematch on the next episode of Impact. Because I started thinking about it. I started going back. I'm like, damn, even back to my WWE days, like like say there was a title change at a pay-per-view on a Sunday. Like on Monday, they'll have a rematch. And then, you know, Impact kind of was doing that too. They would do that after Bound for Glory and Slammiversary. Mainly, mainly, you know, during the Dixie days or whatever. But then I'm like, okay, we're building up to this pay-per-view. So let's say wrestler X is challenging for the X division championship. They're building up to this pay-per-view for like three, four weeks. Okay. Finally gets the match wins. Like if you're taking that long to build the first match, why are we getting the match just thrown together the second night? You know? So I think it was cool that they made us wait a little bit for rich Swan, but it would have been nice at least if Rich Swan acted like he wanted his title back over the last couple of weeks. Like when Jay Chris walked out last week with the title and are you guys looking at my championship? Like Rich Swan wasn't acting like the former champion. He was acting like the rest of those guys, just kind of acting like a jabron, just kind of looking at the title. So this match was, uh, I'm, I'm a huge Rich Swan fan, was fairly certain he wasn't going to win, but the match was okay. I just, I really expected a little bit more for it the Tanil dashwood video package i thought was okay but it doesn't matter if it was great or horrible this was a really outstanding signing and i cannot wait to see her in an impact ring and i'm sure she will be she even said it in the package but i'm pretty sure she's going to be in the knockouts title picture very quickly i'm willing to bet on it the the uh desi hit squad on the deaner's farm was pretty funny I like seeing him in the uh, the overalls. It was funny because uh, Gama and Raj still had their headdress on, but um, I know Ro- Rohit doesn't wear one, but he was like kind of unnecessarily wearing the hat, the straw hat. <laughs> so it was cool. I'm looking forward to seeing when that's going forward because it's lighthearted humor, and uh, we got a really good match between them. So I'm cool with seeing a little night, a uh, little lighthearted humor with that. The Taya press conference. She's talking about. She's going to be the longest reigning knockouts champion. I'm still unclear if she will be the longest reigning champion before the Mexico show or 
at the Mexico show or after it. I don't really, I'm, I'm really unclear, but it's always funny how it always, these title reigns always almost to the day is, is an actual TV taping. So I would have, what I would have really liked to see is Taryn Terrell's appear in a, um, uh, open, open, uh, challenge as her opponent and try to prevent the title, you know, the record from, from, uh, taking place. And I think they could have at least made us feel like that was going to happen. But the fact that she says she's going to face someone that everyone's been talking about, I'm really willing to bet she's just going to face some like local competitor. They're going to give her like a joke character and she's going to beat her in like 30 seconds and be like, okay, now I don't have to, you know, defend the title. So I think that's a good opportunity for them to come with her next opponent at that point. But it would be really cool for her to get another surprise opponent at that point. So we'll see, but I'm, I'm kind of willing to bet whoever she faces is going to be a joke. But what Ty is doing with Johnny Bravo and the dog and everything is really good. Hilarious. Uh, Willie Mack took on Trey. This was entertaining and meant nothing. It meant absolutely nothing. So I don't really know where they're going with it. I don't know if they're trying to work towards an angle. I don't know. I mean, they've already had a match with RVD and everything. I don't know if they're trying to work on some kind of Swan Mack angle versus Rascals, but... In my way too early Bound for Glory predictions, I'll let you know what I think Willie Mack and Swan are going to be doing at Bound for Glory, so stay tuned. I was glad to see Willie Mack get the win here because Willie Mack doesn't win a whole lot. And I don't know what this leading... like As I said, the match meant absolutely nothing. So I don't know what the point of it was. You know, I would have rather seen a match like this kick off the show and then give us Cage and... Uh, Elgin later, not Cage, but Rhino and Elgin later. You know what I mean? It would have made a little more sense because it's okay if the opening match doesn't mean a whole lot. It's a, that's usually the spot where like, hey, we just want to give you something entertaining. Then Sammy Callahan versus Tommy Dreamer. You know, it was Tommy Dreamer in the main event. You know how I think feel about that. You know how I feel about him on my TV period. This match didn't do a whole lot for me. I was glad Sammy won. He needed to win. And I, I kind of would like to have seen them just go off the air with Sammy. You know, it's okay to keep Tessa Blanchard off TV for a week. You know, sometimes less is more, but impact's not going to do that when it comes to Tessa. They're They're going to get her on TV and they're going to try to get her looking strong as often as possible. So the fact that they keep that Tessa keeps going after Sammy, it kind of tells me what I said earlier that Sammy Sammy may get his world title shot on an episode of Impact, and then we're going to get another Sammy versus Tessa match at the pay-per-view. Where I think, at first we were thinking, oh, well, Sammy might take the title off Cage, and then Tessa might take it off him. You know, but I'm starting to think that Tessa and Sammy are going to end up having another match at Bound for Glory. I think I might have said Slammiversary a second ago. If I did, I'm sorry. But I think they're going to get another match at Bound for Glory. And then possibly Moose is going to move into that title picture against Cage. So, interesting. But it's not predictable. You can say that much. But Cali Combat overall, you know, I, I give it a, a 7 on a scale to 10, you know, average. When you have these specials and they're promoting them, hey, this is a special. This is Cali Combat. You got to pretty much give us a pay-per-view on TV. <coughs> Because now you're getting, you know, you're probably going to get a handful, of, more than a handful, I hope, but of, of new viewers that are real casual with Impact. And be like, okay, well, this is a special. I'll check this one because this should be better than the average Impact episode. Then you get one where nothing really went into the next gear. And you're just like, well, why am I watching this? Real Same with the monthly specials where now they're doing things that actually matter. But for the longest time, nothing mattered on those shows. So why why would people care? It was even worse with the one night only. It's like nothing mattered on those. They act like they didn't even exist. So now they're at least acknowledging them on television. So next week, uh, they'll be in Fronton, Mexico. Uh, I love the Mexico tapings. All I want them to do is avoid putting your baby face talent against their local competitors because they're not going to cheer for the baby face over these guys. Put your local competitors, excuse me, put your local competitors against the Impact heels. And then if a babyface is going to wrestle, make sure he's wrestling someone on the Impact roster. 
stop with that crap. Your baby faces are not going to be over against their people. It doesn't matter who they're going up against. That's it for the B-side this week, folks. Uh, right around the 40-minute mark is like where I like to keep it. So we will talk to you guys next week, and I will check your comments the first 24 hours of the upload on YouTube. Talk to you soon. Peace.